But the election last week put beyond any reasonable argument our mandate to offer people in Scotland that choice. In last week's election, the Conservatives won a resounding victory, with the party picking up 365 seats in the House of Commons. This is a story which has been well reported, and we've already made two videos discussing the results. But it wasn't just the Conservatives who did well in last week's election. The SNP also performed way better than many expected. So in this video, we're going to discuss the results in Scotland and what it means for the future of the country and the rest of the United Kingdom. This wouldn't be a TLDR video if I didn't take the opportunity to remind you that we're selling pin badges, including a Scotland and United Kingdom badge. We've also got Christmas charity badges, where all of the money goes to causes working in their respective countries. Find them all in the store linked down below. You might be wondering why we're tackling this issue today, when we only talked about Scottish independence last week. If you're thinking that, you might need a refresh on quite how significant this election was for the Scottish National Party. The SNP first emerged as a presence in Westminster back in 1935, when they captured 1.1% of the vote and zero seats in Parliament. This trend continued up until 1970, when they picked up their first MP. The exact number of MPs fluctuated over the next 40 years or so, but generally stayed within the single digits. That all changed in 2015, when the SNP exploded on the national stage, winning 56 of the 59 seats in Scotland. The exact reason for this surge can be discussed in another video, but the following two elections were also strong for the SNP. 2017 saw them down slightly to 35 seats, before rising to near Scottish domination in 2019. The actual results for Scotland in the 2019 election were as follows. The SNP got 48 seats, with 45% of the total vote. The Conservatives got 6 seats, with 25% of the vote. The Lib Dems got 4 seats with 9.5% and Labour got 1 seat with 186 The Greens and Brexit Party got no seats in Scotland, but did pick up 1 and 0.5% of the vote respectively. While the SNP didn't get a majority, the vote was a clear win for the party in Scotland, with the SNP performing strongly across the map. So the question really is, what does this mean for the future of Scotland? Well, one of the SNP's core principles, as you might expect from their name, is to advocate for Scottish independence. It's one of the SNP's most fundamental reasons for being, so they're always going to advocate for the cause. With their success in recent elections, the SNP now have more of a voice than ever to call for Scottish independence. The SNP victory last week follows others in 2016 and 2017. So the mandate we have to offer the Scottish people a choice over their future is by any normal standard of democracy, unarguable. That being said, it would be disingenuous to say that because the SNP won a majority of seats, that all Scots want to see an independent Scotland. For one, if you add together the number of people who voted for Unionist and Nationalist parties, you'll see that more people backed Unionist parties overall. More importantly though, not all SNP voters will be looking for Scottish independence. The Scottish National Party have a whole range of policies, and although independence is key to their platform, it's not the only reason that voters may choose to support them. In fact, this is something the SNP's leader, Nicola Sturgeon, even acknowledged when speaking to Andrew Marr on Sunday, saying, I don't presume everyone who voted SNP on Thursday is yet prepared to back independence, but it's for the people of Scotland to decide. Their increasing strength in Scotland might show that some Scots are now itching for independence, but it doesn't actually give the Scottish people the power to make it happen. That's because in order for a referendum on Scottish independence to be held, it has to be approved by Westminster. The Scotland Act of 1998 states that the Scottish Parliament is not allowed to pass legislation on matters reserved for Westminster, such as issues related to the union of the kingdoms of Scotland and England. As a result, UK law says that the Westminster Parliament has to pass a law before the referendum can be held. Scotland could hold an advisory referendum without Westminster's sign-off, but the UK government could simply ignore its result. Essentially, if the UK government doesn't want a referendum on Scotland, it doesn't happen, or at least not without going to the Supreme Court for a major constitutional fight. Before the election, some speculated that Labour might be looking to form a coalition with the SNP if it helped them to form a government. They theorised that if Corbyn came close to a victory, the SNP could lend him the votes in return for another referendum on Scottish independence. This could have been the SNP's foot in the door, and could have moved them towards the type of Scotland they want to see. 
Unfortunately for the SNP's independence plans, the Conservatives managed to pull together a convincing majority and certainly didn't need the support of any other parties. The SNP may well have picked up seats and might have won in Scotland, but the Conservatives still hold the power in this government and unless a huge number of MPs were to rebel against their own party, there doesn't seem much need for them to cooperate with smaller parties like the SNP. So ultimately, it's up to the Conservatives to decide if there will be a referendum on Scotland in the next five years, or however long they end up being in power for. Unfortunately for the SNPs, the Tories aren't in favour of Scottish independence, or even another vote on the topic. Throughout the election campaign, Boris Johnson and a parade of other senior figures said that they wouldn't support another referendum, and it seems like they're sticking to their guns. After the election, Sturgeon spoke to Johnson and the Prime Minister reiterated that he was opposed to a second referendum. In fact, a Downing Street spokesman said that the Prime Minister was standing with the majority of people in Scotland who do not want to return to division and uncertainty. And it's not just the Prime Minister either, with Michael Gove saying that in this general election, we have just seen what happens when politicians try and overturn a referendum result. And in the same way, we should respect the referendum result in 2014 in Scotland. So despite the SNP's success in this election, the ultimate victors, the Conservatives, still aren't keen and will be blocking any moves the SNP make. But that doesn't mean that Sturgeon or the SNP plan to leave this issue there. Sturgeon has already begun to make the case for an independence vote, saying that Scotland couldn't be imprisoned in the UK against its will. Hold Scotland in the Union against its will. You cannot sort of just lock us in a cupboard and turn the key in and hope that everything goes away. If, if the Union, if the United Kingdom is to continue, then it can only be by consent. And if Boris Johnson is confident in the case for the Union, then he should be confident enough to make that case and allow people to decide. This might sound like rather inflammatory language, but let's take a look at what she means. Sturgeon is trying to highlight the disparity between the will of the Scottish people and the outcomes of UK-wide votes. This election resulted in the continued rule of a right-wing government, a government whose win was solidified by English voters. In fact, despite their majority, in Scotland, the Conservatives' vote share dropped by 3.5%, and their number of seats fell by 7%. Instead, Scots voted to support a more left-wing SNP, a vote which has been completely contradicted by the English votes. Sturgeon also highlighted that this happened in 2016, where the majority of Scots voted to remain in the EU, but due to the UK's overall vote, the country will be pulled out alongside the rest of the UK. The government would likely retort that we've already had a referendum on this, and that the majority of Scots didn't want to leave. Beyond that, the most recent polling shows that to this day, the majority of Scots don't want to see Scotland breaking away from the rest of the UK. However, there's an argument to be made that things are changing, and it might be possible for the SNP to get a majority of Scots to back independence. So I accept that the case for independence is yet to be won, but the election last week put beyond any reasonable argument our mandate to offer people in Scotland that choice. We built a coalition around this principle and now that the election is over, I believe an even broader coalition is being formed. And the right to choose is not just a demand from me as First Minister or from the SNP. It is based on the solemn right of the people of Scotland to decide our own future. Let's take some of Sturgeon's recent examples. The fact that the UK is being led by a government counter to Scotland's will, or that they're being taken out of the EU. Take the policies that Johnson's government wants to introduce that contrast the views of the more centrist Scottish people. Take the fact that Northern Ireland has been given special access to the EU and Scotland isn't. Take the expansion of the Trident nuclear programme, which is housed in Scotland but many Scots oppose. You might not agree with those arguments, but it's clear that there could be some movement when it comes to Scotland's feelings around independence. We'll leave that there though, as there's far too many arguments to be made on both sides of the Scottish independence debate, and we've already discussed that earlier this week, so we don't want to retread old ground. Essentially though, the election has changed the political landscape when it comes to Scottish independence. The Conservatives' significant majority hands them all the cards when it comes to the idea of an independence referendum, despite rising support for the Scottish National Party. The SNP say that they'll be looking for legal ways around the Conservatives' grips on control, but it's not clear at this stage how they could force an independence vote, even if it did look like the majority of Scots would support it. If you want to be updated on this issue as it plays out, be sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you want to be notified every time we release a video, tap the bell icon too. 
And finally, if you want to see your name at the end of the videos, just like these people, then sign up to our Patreon. There's a link to that down below.